So here today to talk about uh, wildfires, um, you know, living in California, it's always a good idea to be investing time uh, for disaster preparedness, whether that relates to earthquakes or wildfires or whatever it may be. Unfortunately, at some point, that investment is going to pay a dividend. And, uh, you know, memories are short here in Southern California. 2019 was actually pretty quiet from a wildfire standpoint. Uh, but I'm sure, you know, um, everybody remembers in 2018, 2018 alone, we had the Mendocino fire, which was the largest fire in California history. The Camp Fire, which unfortunately was the deadliest fire in California history. And then right here in our backyard, uh, the Woosley Fire, which destroyed over 1,600 structures. And just a few months before that, towards the end of uh, late 2017, was the Thomas Fire, which destroyed over 1,000 structures. So all that to say is um, sometimes our memories are short, but just a reminder that we are getting into fire season again. We obviously have a big fire right now, um, just on the other side of the stake that I think is still going on. And so today we wanna to discuss a few things about wildfires, give you some tips on things like the right landscaping to have near your home, how a fire behaves, how the future might look for this season. And to do that, we're fortunate enough to have two wildfire experts join us. Uh, so we have Mr. Uh, Dr. John Keeley from the US Geological Survey and UCLA. Uh, Dr. Keeley is a fire ecologist investigating historical fire patterns and the relationship to climate and urban development. He is currently a research scientist with the U.S. Geological Survey and as an adjunct professor at UCLA. Other research focuses on the impact of perturb uh, perturbations, hopefully I said that right, in fire regimes on invasive plants in Mediterranean climate ecosystems. Uh, also joining us is Battalion Chief Drew Smith from LA County Fire Department. Uh, Drew Smith has been with the LA County Fire Department since 1988. He's fought Santa Ana driven wildfires for over 30 years now and leads the Northwest LA County Battalion, including Calabasas, Malibu, and the surrounding hillside community. So thank you both gentlemen for being with us uh, tonight. And the first question is for Dr. Keeley, and that's a two part question. The question is, uh, what do we expect this fire season to be like? And can you talk a little bit just about how a fire spreads? Sure, Tim. Um, well, we hear a lot in the media about predictions of what the uh, fire season is going to be like. Most of those predictions come from climatologists who uh, assume climate is the primary driver of fire, really is a function of where you are in the California in terms of the importance of climate um, because it varies markedly across the, the state. We have done studies uh, that have looked at the relationship of fire activity in a given year and the climate in that year for over 100 years and what we find is is if you're in the Sierra Nevada mountains which incidentally is where I live uh, the climate is very important in terms of determining fire activity because the forests in the Sierra Nevada and Northern California are relatively mesic forests. And so if you have a really dry spring, a really dry summer, uh, it increases fire activity. And we found that we can predict at least 50% of the time uh, the fire activity, just knowing spring and summer temperatures. But when you get to Southern California, uh, that doesn't hold. We can't predict fire activity based on climate alone. And the primary reason is that it's hot enough and dry enough every year in Southern California to carry a fire. There are other things uh, that are gonna drive these fires. And it's primarily the Santa Ana winds, which we get every autumn. Uh, we get anywhere from uh, 20 to 60 days a year of Santa Ana winds, and anybody who lives in Southern California knows these winds, uh, they are what drive the, the fire activity. But what's interesting is about 80% of the days that have Santa Ana winds, we have no fire activity at all. And so it's not the winds per se that cause the fire. It's a human ignition, either uh, intentionally, like arson, or accidentally, including things like power line failures that occur uh, with the Santa Ana winds. And when we get those ignitions during the wind events, that's when we get the big fire events. And as a result, we have to be able to predict what humans are going to do. And we have very little ability to predict human behavior. As a result, I don't think we can make 
good predictions about what the fire season is, is likely to be like uh, this uh, coming year. Uh, because the potential is there if someone lights a fire during the Santa Ana wind, we potentially could have a big fire year. And if uh, we don't get an ignition, then uh, we may not uh, have a big uh, fire event. So those are the big things to keep in mind. It's really all about human ignitions during a severe wind event and the coincidence of those. And it happens relatively infrequently. Like I said, 80% of the days with Santa Ana winds, we get no fire activity at all. So uh, how do we predict what humans are gonna do? Very difficult. As a result, the people who model uh, uh, seasonal fire predictions, they just assume that ignitions are not limiting uh, because they simply can't model human behavior. Uh, as a result, those models really don't apply very well to Southern California. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Keela. That's definitely interesting. Would you say the, the single biggest uh, determining factor in how quickly a fire spreads, would wind be that uh, key factor? Or if not, what might that be? Well, the wind is certainly a factor. Once you get an ignition during a Santa Ana wind event, the severity of the wind event, which varies from one wind event to another, will affect how fast it spreads. But the other really big factor is uh, antecedent drought. If you've had a severe drought, prior to the uh, uh, fire, uh, that will have a big impact. For example, uh, between 2012 and 2017, we had a very severe drought in Southern California. This called, caused massive dieback of chaparral vegetation. And we have recently been using remote uh, imagery to document the extent of that dieback. And we've overlaid that on the Woolsey fire. And what we see is vast amounts of the area within the Woolsey fire had extensive dieback. And right now we're uh, in the process of trying to correlate that with patterns of fire severity. So the drought almost certainly had a big impact on that fire. And we're doing the same thing with the Thomas fire, same pattern we're seeing, extensive dieback. And what's interesting is the dieback in the Thomas fire was extensive in the hills up above Montecito where uh, you recall we had extensive flood damage after the fire. So this uh, extreme drought and dieback is another major factor in Southern California. Thank you, doctor. So question for you, Chief Smith, how are you preparing differently now in light of uh, COVID-19? Well, um, our, the way that we're fighting fire has changed. Our, what I like to call our family, dynamics, our fire family dynamics, we live together for 24 hours. So we are a close knit bunch. So with social distancing practices, the COVID-19 practices, if you it, it is significantly modified our behavior on how we can interact in fire stations and taking that out to fire camps, if you will. So some of the larger fires that go on that you could have a fire camp built that can range from 2,000 to 7,000 people that we need to logistically support, we need to sleep, we need to feed, we need to put them on the line to uh, go to work for that day to combat the fire. So there's a lot of moving parts. And so we have really modified our behavior on how business was done compared to how business needs to be now in our fire camp. So. For example, our meals, we don't have the long chow lines where you stand in line. Uh, it's a little bit rough. Let's um, uh, move on to the next question for uh, Dr. Keeley. Uh, Steve Smith will come back to you momentarily. Uh, so question for uh, Dr. Keeley. Uh, what are some things that folks can do to protect their homes from a wildfire? Well, the uh, probably Probably the most important thing is where uh, you plant vegetation. For example, um, vegetation adjacent to your house, really dangerous. And the recommendation generally is you don't plant anything within five feet of your house. You don't have wooden structures like fences touching your house uh, because they can carry fire to the home. And then uh, for a hundred feet, uh, around your home. You need to have 
uh, uh, some clearance. And it doesn't actually have to be vegetation that are cleared completely away. But what you need to have is widely spaced vegetation that dead uh, branches and whatnot are trimmed up to like six feet above the ground. And this prevents fire from moving into the canopy. However, the one thing that uh, is clear, and, and I'm sure Chief Smith can, can uh, elaborate on this more, is most of our burn, not on the fire front, burning into vegetation around the home and lighting the home, but rather the embers that land on the house and ignite it. And so anything that might reduce the ember flow onto the house. For example, some people have suggested if you have trees planted around your property and they are adequately maintained, so the moisture level is such that the embers won't ignite the trees, they actually can catch the embers and stop the embers from reaching the home. So that's one possible um, thing people can do, although this is, this is really speculation at this point. We don't really have good evidence that trees actually collect embers, but just from observations, it's, a, it's clear that they have the potential. The other thing is we've done studies where we've looked at homes that have been destroyed and ones that haven't. And the one thing that stands out very clearly as a controlling factor is if you have a tree hanging over your house, turns out the tree itself is not what ignites your house. It's all the dead litter and uh, uh, leaves and branches that land on your house. And then the embers land on those, uh, uh, that litter and ignite the house. So the one thing that everybody should do is if you have a tree around your house, make sure before the fire season begins, you get up on that roof, you clear off all the dead leaves and branches. And I can tell you, I've traveled around a lot of neighborhoods in Southern California and a lot of people have a lot of litter on their roofs. And that's uh, really a, a, a real uh, dangerous situation when it comes to these uh, windblown uh, ember uh, loads that land on the house. Terrific, thank you, doctor. So let's see if we can uh, hear uh... Uh, Chief Smith, can you hear us okay? Uh, did you have uh, anything you'd like to add to that? Um, I have a bunch to add to that. So Fantastic. this and this, can you hear me better now? I kind of yeah, moved. Yeah, absolutely. Up. Thank you. Fabulous. So um, that on how does um, protecting their homes and, and Dr. Healy talked to embers. And going back to your first question, Dr. Keeley, is how does fire spread? Well, fire spreads also in a wind-driven fire environment through spotting in a receptive fuel bed. So this really couples with question number one that you had to where we have an advancing fire front on a Santa Ana wind driven fire. And we'll just focus on that because the dynamics in a plume dominated event in a mixed conifer compared to uh, the local vegetation in Southern California, the, the spread is different, but the ember cast and what is able to receive those embers and what those, that residency time is on the ground and what fuel bed that it lands in. So to Dr. Keeley's point as well, he talks about clearing around vegetation around your home. If there is light leaf litter, there's light twigs, there's grass, that is a very nice host for these embers to catch and then impact your home. So the, the receptive fuel bed is that leaf litter that's in your rain gutters, it's around your house, it could be your wicker furniture that's um, around your home. And going also coupling into uh, the live fuels that are around your home, it, it's, as Dr. Keeley could attest to this as well, the higher the fuel moisture content is in a living fuel, the harder it is for a smaller ignition source to catch it on fire. To where if you have a live fuel, whether it be ornamental vegetation or native vegetation, the drier it is, the le less amount of a heat source you need to ignite whatever's around it. And that goes into live fuels and dead fuels. And so the, the homeowners really need to take back on why we do our brush clearance and why we are very, very particular in how you manicure your homes because of the receptive fuel bed. Significant amount of the times, it's not the advancing fire front that burns your home down. It is the ember cast that catches stuff around your home. 
um, that, that, that causes uh, the, the, the structure fire loss in a lot of cases. I'm sure Dr. Keeley would like to add into that. Well, I think no, there's no me, question the ember cast is what we need to be concerned about. But I think we're gonna get into that with some of the further questions. So go ahead, Timothy. Yeah, and I apologize, I was muted there for a second. I wanted to ask you, I'd like to ask you both, and Dr. Keeley, perhaps we could start with you. What makes a, a fire in Southern California different from a Northern California fire? Well, there are a couple things Southern California says the role of climate, summer temperatures, really important in Sierra Nevada. Not so important in Southern California. Uh, but what's really different about these regions is the fuels. In Southern California, most of our fires end up starting in grasses that are along roads. And in fact, if you map the distribution of ignition sources in Southern California, most of them are along roadways. And what we typically have along roads are grasses because of clearance and disturbance of the environment. And that's where most of our big fires start. For example, the Springs Fire in Ventura County in 2013 started from a vehicle that ignited grasses along the road. Uh, the Apple Fire that uh, just occurred out in Riverside County, same thing, diesel engine threw out sparks that hit the grass. Uh, the, these are not grass fires, but the grass is what is like a wick and it carries that fire into the heavy vegetation that is very hazardous. And so that's one of the big characteristics of Southern California. Our fires typically will start uh, from grasses and burn into heavier fuels. And climate plays a di very different role when it comes to grass fires. Uh, grass fires are limited by the amount of fuel available. So when we have a drought, a very dry year, uh, we generally won't have the propensity for grass fires because there's not a lot of grass growth. In fact, here in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada, when there's a drought, the high mountains are very susceptible to fires. The foothills are not because they don't have, they're mostly grass and they don't have a lot of fuel. And so drought in this part of the world uh, means less grass fires, uh, but a very high rainfall year means a lot of fuel, a lot of potential. So there's that interaction between the type of fuel and climate that uh, separate uh, these, uh, these regions. Then of course, you know, just the population density in the different parts of uh, the state uh, have a big impact on not just the incidence of fires, but also uh, the impact of those fires. Sure, thank you. Uh, Chief Smith, anything you'd like to add to that in regards to what makes a, a Southern California fire a little different from a Northern California fire? I do. So a lot of times folks think in Southern California, they think the worst case scenario. We have a lot of fire frequency in Southern California and the environment is very sensitive to how a fire is going to burn. And routinely we have topography dominated fires. We have our prime uh, fire season that starts in, in May and June, depending if you're inland or closer to the coast, and then going through Halloween-ish, or sometimes Christmas, as that is our prime fire season. However, throughout the course of the summer, when we have 85 degree days, we have relative humidities at 25% and winds are out of the southwest, it creates a fire environment that's topography driven in nature and we don't have the Santa Ana wind type of fire. So we do have another type of fire besides the Santa Ana wind driven fires in Southern California. And a lot of those are um, very routine and manageable because they're, if you think that there's only two forces of energy that move fire across the landscape, it's either wind energy or slope energy. And depending on which is the dominant factor is going to really drive how your fire is going to react. And under those environmental conditions to where you could have a very aggressive fire during the day on a 
90 degree day in the inland Calabasas area, but if your favored was 65 to 80 percent recoveries in relative humidity at night, that that fire activity dramatically decreases based upon a routine summer day. So there's really two different um, fire uh, scenarios in Southern California. And we can have a fire any time of the year, but usually our fires that are outside of our classic summertime scenario, there's an anomaly of some sort. And that anomaly may be being in a drought stretch of vegetation like we had leading into the springs fire and then we had a Santa Ana wind event in an early spring which is abnormally normal I guess you could say we do have those but the frequency of those aren't as routine where we could say safely that we are going to in the fall have Santa Ana wind events. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Dr. Keeley, what advice do you have for folks that want to learn more about fires in Southern California? Oh, hopefully we didn't lose Dr. Uh, Dr. Keeley. He is very still. <laughs> I know. Great. I think um, uh, Captain uh, Chief Smith, does the LA County Fire Department have any sort of resources for folks to be able to learn more about fires or get resources from? Yeah, sir. So um, the Los Angeles County Fire Department has a very robust public information office. So you want to get fire information. Mm -hmm. You could get fire information on active incidents. You can go to uh, California Department of uh, Fire as well as you can go that um, California Department of Forestry and Fire Protection. You can go to the U.S. Forest Service. All those big agencies host a public information office that does give intelligence on a fire. But learning about fire there's a significant amount of resources um, through um, actually distant learning in the internet that you can, you can get this. this. One of them is the Lessons Learn Center where you can learn uh, about that, which is hosted by the um, US Forest Service in collaboration with all the federal agencies actually. And, um, and so there's a lot of ways to get this uh, education, if you will, if you just wanted to look at uh, fire behavior or fire history. Thank you. We'll make sure we send out some of this info too after the webinar to our to our viewers. Can we get that together. Uh, Dr. Keeley, do we have you back? Okay, so we'll keep moving along. Hopefully, uh, I know you know Dr. Keeley's in the Sierra Nevada mountains uh, yeah. via satellite, so mm -hmm. it's a little uh, a little uh, tougher, I'm sure, to get a good connection. Uh, so, Chief Smith, another question for you. Um, how does fighting fires in this area differ from those in a more forested type area? Uh, well, uh, as we touched on a little bit, the fire dynamics are different. So if you're up in like in the Sierra Nevadas where uh, Dr. Keeley's at, the access and road systems are more challenging. The, maybe the water delivery may be more challenging. It does affect based upon topography, how we can get our ground resources in there how we can get our air resources uh, to combat a fire. I can say within Los Angeles County, with the Los Angeles County Fire Department and our cooperating agencies that we use all the time, we have the most robust, aggressive firefighting workforce in the nation for what we put at a first alarm fire or a reported fire. And so the challenges are very different to where I fought, being on a federal interagency incident management team, I've been to Alaska, I've been all through California, the Western United States, I've been to the South, and every area has its own characteristics on those fuel characteristics, but also the landscape characteristics, because you can't fight a timber fire, and I'll give you an example with helicopters that Los Angeles County Fire Department uses, because we have fixed uh, tanks on our aircraft where you're up in a forested area where you have a hundred foot tall trees you need helicopters with buckets and long lines to pinpoint what you're doing and also the uh, ta uh, tac tactical engagement obligation is going to be different to where you need to move people to combat and we put people in forested areas up in these spike camps that they're living up there for 14 days and walking to their line assignment to combat the fire. Uh, we're slinging in their food to them to camp out there so we can continue the line production 
in, in, in conjunction with the air assets to contain this. So there's, there's a significant, significant difference in uh, wildland firefighting in Southern California as compared to Northern California or in timbered areas. Interesting, wow, thank you. So let's see if we, I think we have Dr. Uh, uh, Keeley back. So question for Dr. Keeley, if someone was thinking of modifying their home in the wildland urban interface, which is where we are, what advice would you give somebody in regards to designs and aesthetics that would protect their property best? Well, there are things that we know are correlated with whether or not a home survives a fire. And some of those things are whether or not you have vegetation growing right adjacent to your house. So one of the recommendations uh, that is often uh, made is you should have hardscape. In other words, rocks or concrete or something like that for the first five feet all the way around your house. And plantings then should be out further from the home. As Jay Lopez from LA County has often said, you should be able to only plant things that you can see from your kitchen window. So in other words, if it, it's so close to the house, you can't see it, you shouldn't plant it. Um, that's one thing. The other thing though is, is there are modifications you can make to your structure. Uh, for example, we've done studies where we've taken huge data sets, like 40,000 homes throughout the state that have been evaluated by CAL FIRE after a fire, and they record a lot of characteristics. And then we look at the characteristics associated, associated with homes that burned versus ones that didn't. There are certain things that stand out. For example, the structure of the vents going into the attic, very critically important. For example, it's often the case that homes are built with open vents. In other words, the rafters come out and the vents uh, are uh, directly uh, adjacent to the house and they essentially are vertical to the uh, ground surface. And those open uh, eaves with the vents vertical to the ground surface seem to carry uh, embers much better into the attic. So closed eaves is associated with reduced uh, structure losses. And probably part of that reason is, is if you have closed eaves where the uh, rafters have, a lay, uh, uh, have uh, boards that are uh, laid across the uh, eaves, the vents then face uh, down towards the ground and less likely to carry embers in. Double pane windows are another factor that seems to be tied to whether or not a house uh, survives. The type of roof construction, but then there are ordinances that drive that. So most homeowners don't need to do uh, much in regard to roof structure. Siding is also affects uh, whether or not a home survives. But the one thing that's probably the easiest change to make in your house uh, economically would be if you change the size of the screen on your vents to your attic, because most of these ember-driven fires uh, burn homes because the embers get sucked into the attic. And the smaller the screen size on that uh, vent, the less likely embers will get in. And so that's something that is relatively economical to do. There are other things people have proposed. For example, some people have proposed uh, sprinklers on your uh, roof that uh, turn on and uh, wet down the roof during a fire. A lot of problems with that, not insurmountable, but there are problems. For example, uh, if you have a sprinkler system that's sprinkling water on your roof, and you have a Santa Ana wind blowing at 50 miles per hour, uh, you're likely to do more for your neighbor's house than for your own because the, the uh, sprinklers get blown somewhere else. Um, and then there's also the fact that, you know, we have power outages during these uh, fire events. And so you'd have to have solar driven power to drive the pumps to produce those, the sprinkler system. Uh, so a lot of, and then just the water itself, you'd have to have a special tank because sometimes water lines uh, get shut down during fire. A lot of problems with it. It's probably not your number one way to go, but it is something that some people have 
uh, proposed. So there are things that homeowners can do. There are also websites that will have information on this. Great, thank you, doctor. And we're, we're getting some questions already, which is fantastic. So we're gonna, probably in the next uh, five or six minutes, uh, we'll be getting to those questions to make sure they all get answered. Uh, so uh, this question is for Chief Smith. In terms of evacuation, uh, Chief, what are the best sources of information for that? Okay, uh, and evacuations are gonna come several ways. And it's one, a unified voice. So when we have a fire, um, the evacuations are done in cooperation with law enforcement. So law enforcement is always on a fire co-located with us, so we're not making independent decisions on evacuations or where, so we have a strategic plan. So with evacuation sources of information, it may be quick to where those, like uh, the fire uh, that has been, been going on up in Lake Hughes, is that that the lake fire that they actually had door knocks it was, it was moving so quick and it's put um depending on where the fire starts is everything comes down to time so if you think about going to the woolsey fire we evacuated 250,000 people in a with plenty of forewarning to leave and still i don't know if that's ever been done in american fire history on an advancing wildfire evacuating 250,000 people with it moving across the 101 at five in the morning, then hitting the coast six hours later. That's a very monumental event and takes a lot of work. So sure. the sources it's gonna come from, the sources is gonna come from door knocks, it's gonna come from helicopters, it could come from patrol cars. Also evacuation warnings are gonna be hailed via um, the public information office. There's gonna be a hosted site that they have and there's a series of different um, web-based information sources that will be broadcast on the news. It'll also be put on the radio uh, information stations on stuff. So the enhancement of how we do evacuations um, are going to be very widespread so it reaches a lot of people. The things with evacuations or anything with, I'll just say, social media, it can be very challenging for people combating the fire through mis information mm -hmm. and how that information is distributed. So it needs to be a credible and reliable source on what you're supposed to do. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much, Chief. You're welcome. Okay. So I'll mention a few things that are relevant um, just from a risk management and insurance standpoint before we get uh, to the questions. Um, so uh, first things first, a lot of folks wonder, you know, wh what are the things you want to grab if you're going to be evacuated from your home? And so before you get to the point where you're evacuating, uh, you actually wanna make sure that if a fire comes through and, and God forbid you lose your house, that you know what was there uh, for the insurance company. And so the, the biggest thing you can do in that regard is documentation. And the easiest way to do documentation, you have it right here. Everybody has a, a camera in their pocket nowadays. So if you just take a video of your home and all the things that you own, that's all you need to do. And that way, if if something uh, was to happen with the home, whether it be fire or smoke damage or whatever it is, you have something you can turn over to the insurance company and also something to help your own memory as far as figuring out what was destroyed. The reason I mention that in regards to evacuating your home is, as long as you have homeowner's insurance that covers your personal property, all your belongings, and most policies do, the only thing you need to worry about first and foremost is yourself and getting yourself out of the house, but then also things that are not replaceable. So a key thing might be medications that you can't get easily or some sort of prescription that you're on. Or certainly any sort of family heirloom or pictures would be something that can't be replaced. Aside from that, don't waste time trying to save your laptop and your cameras and your pen collection because the reality is the insurance company's gonna pay for those things. Uh, second to that, I would say uh, from a coverage standpoint, something that we learned uh, through house fires and especially through the Woosley fire Homes are really, really, really expensive to rebuild, and they take a really long time. And so as an example, uh, we're finding that we haven't seen a single home built for less than $300 a square foot. And that was pretty basic construction, uh, nothing too terribly fancy. And so you wanna take a look at your insurance policy and make sure your home insurance limit is equal to at least $300 a square foot. And I'll tell you, if your home is in the Oaks or Bell Canyon or Hidden Hills or if you had a contractor that really took a lot of time doing custom cabinets in your kitchen, it's more than that. 
And then the other thing I'll mention from an insurance standpoint is the loss of use coverage. So that's the one that pays for you to stay in a hotel if you get evacuated, but it also pays for you to rent a home or live in a hotel if your home's being rebuilt. And if your home is destroyed in the wildfire, it's not being rebuilt in a year. Um, certainly not anywhere between, within LA or Ventura counties. It just takes a while. It's not just the permitting process, although that does take time. It's also the fact that it's pretty difficult to find a contractor and a moment's notice that can go and build a house. These folks are already really busy. Everybody's doing remodels with COVID. And so it's going to take a, a, a significant amount of time just to get the permits and the bids and just to even start demolition. So realistically, you want to assume that at bare minimum, you're going to be out of your house for two years if it's a total loss. And we still have, believe it or not, a few losses that are just being finished up now uh, from the Woosley fire. And that was with the insurance companies paying every dime. It just took time to be able to get to a point uh, where these things could actually be um, actually be replaced. And so again, the, the key thing though is listening to the professionals that we have on the call today, uh, because an ounce of prevention is certainly worth a whole lot more. By the time you're using your insurance policy, it means obviously uh, the damage has already occurred. So great. So I'd like to go ahead and start answering uh, some of the questions that we have here on our call. Uh, so the first one here, we have a question. Uh, what about access to water in hills where there's a lot of houses? How, how does uh, does the fire department use swimming pools is one of the questions. Uh, yes, the fire department does use swimming pools. So there is ordinance in place, depending upon where your home is, it comes down to water and access. So there's limitations on what the narrowest of road may be, but also the availability to um, water systems to combat a fire at that home. So we don't look at the, really the, do we have the hydrants in place to combat that wildfire? That that hydrant system and or that private water supply that may be well water that may be put to a tank and then has for fire department use because I'll just say it's in the back country outside of the grid is there is requirements and so yes we do and there's a set of standards that you have to have to have that fire flow capabilities based upon the square footage of your home. Okay great. And then a question here so uh, there's a uh, a viewer that would like to know recommendation about any fire wise communities. So I'm actually not sure what that means, but <laughs> perhaps one of our panelists do. Um, I, I don't have a good thing on the fire wise communities or what mm -hmm. their approach is. I know some of the basics of fire wise communities, it's kind of like the neighborhood watch. Mm -hmm. It's fire wise that they're um, astute to the um, how the landscaping is and that they're talking quite a bit, how they have evacuation plans, that they're information sharing. And so these fire wise communities, it's a network. And also with uh, building standards of new homes that go into uh, place. So there's a very, there's a whole different sets of layers of the fire wise communities. And it's basically unification of those communities that have um, an infrastructure in place uh, throughout however the builder was and also with the occupants that support um, the homes that are there, those fire wife communities. So additional question, you know, we saw a lot of folks, and this is in every fire, we certainly saw it with the Woosley fire where folks were on their roof with a garden hose and they were spraying away at their roof for the fire is once, you know, an evacuation order is, is uh, put into place. Is there any situation where it makes sense to stay back and try to fight the fire yourself? No, so he here, here's the challenge with that. When people stay back and combat the fire on their own, they could be in a good position and have a set of circumstances that bring some good luck into what's going on. But the fire environment can change and then if they're untrained, and now they have to put themselves in a position to leave. And we find that a lot to where once they leave, they put themselves in a different set of circumstances to navigate the roads. Everything's good to say that you want to stay and fight your own fire until the, un and until the environmental conditions of the fire become unattainable. And now what are your options when your options could have been as we go by life, property, the environment, mm -hmm. life number one. 
and you can and we have a lot of uh, there's a lot of challenges that come with that, and a lot of fatalities that could happen. I'm sure. Yeah. Thank you. Great. There's a question: Is there a central fire notification system uh, for residents to be alerted, or is it really just by law enforcement um, department to get the word out? No, no, it is it is centralized, and once again, that that uh, media campaign or that media campaign will push stuff. Or we have a liaison officer, public information officer, that public information officer, and so the evacuations and how it's being driven and how far, and then what you are to do comes out of the unified command structure of or the command structure of the organization that's running the fire. So if Los Angeles County Fire Department has a fire in, in Agora, we are responsible for that fire. We have our cooperators with Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department out of the Los Hill Sheriff Station. And we co-locate to give the direction on what we're going to, because there's only, there's only really three things you're going to do. You have an evacuation order, you have an evacuation or, um, uh, warning, and then you have a shelter in place. And then we go into repopulation. So you will get one of those orders and it'll be once again broadcasted via sheriffs, which are gonna populate the area to do door knocks is what they do. They put themselves in, in a very dangerous position because they don't have fire hose. They don't have the same training, but they're there in the public safety element to evacuate people on PAs in their squad cars doing that type of business. But it's sure. also gonna be social media blast throughout. And once again, you have to know the credible source of what it is and it's gonna be coming from, and it'll say by orders of the Sheriff's Department, the Los Angeles County Fire Department, et cetera, or Office of Emergency Management within Los Angeles County. Great. Thank you. Great. Uh, so question, are you currently as a fire department, so this be a question for uh, Chief Smith, uh, checking on properties for brush clearance at this point, or do you rely on the homeowners to fill out the questionnaire that you sent out? No, well, yes and yes. So we have in, in the Santa Monica Mountains for Los Angeles County, we have 11,700 brush inspections to do. Wow. So we go out in our local fire stations doing their day-to-day -day business, 911 calls and everything that we do, we go out and do those through the 12 stations that are within the Santa Monica Mountains. And, and, the, and the cities that are there. And so we go and do on-site inspections. We have heard rumors that we use cameras, we use drones, we don't do that. We go and drive to those addresses and, um, and look for the compliance of the uh, brush clearance standard. Correct. And it looks like we're um, down to our last couple of questions here. There's a, there was a follow-up question to the pool if somebody was to leave a pump apparatus set up for the swimming pool, is that something that would be helpful, Chief, or would the fire department have their own and simply ignore that pump? We would not ignore that pump. If it's serviceable and we went in and we're gonna use a pool, because we have ways to get, do long hose lays and actually draft out of a pool within a thing we call an, an adductor. Mm -hmm. But if somebody has a pump that's there and giving the set of circumstances that may become uh, a viable option for us because it gives us different tactical advantage to use it, by all means, we will use it if it's sound mechanically and if it has value in the combat at the time. Right. And then the last question, so this has actually been in the press quite a bit. Um, it was re reported, especially during the Woosley fire. So there's some insurance carriers that are out there that have their own private firefighters that they hire. And the question is, uh, how do you work with them um, those uh, private firefighters that are not part of LA County or LA City. Okay, we work with them all the time. So we will have um, insurance company that have a firefighting component and they come in usually what is called or classified as a type six engine. It's basically a pickup truck with a complement of hose and um, a nice equipment that we've seen. And there we tie in with them, they can't go rogue and just start doing business because we have to have common communications in case we have an incident that happens within the incident that we're fighting. So they can go on their property, they check in with us, we put them to work. If they're gonna be up on a large ranch type of property, which I can say on the Woolsey, we use them um, in a lot of different areas. So we would 
know who's there. Even as the incident gets bigger, they have an agency representative that goes and we have, we put a fire person in charge just to handle all the insurance firefighting resources. And they say that they would like to be at such and such address, such and, and we document that. We know what division or branch that it's in. We know the leadership that's in place and we build them into our plan. Great. Well, thank you to both uh, Dr. Keeley, uh, Chief Smith. You know, we went over, I think some really great stuff tonight. And the reality is, you know, not to overstate the importance of it, but some of the, some of the advice that you gave tonight, you know, it could save a property, it could save a life. And um, especially in the heat of the moment, even if, if some of our folks that attended can even just remember just a, one of these things, I think it's absolutely worth the time investment. And uh, I personally really appreciate the work that both of you guys do and uh, taking the time to be with us tonight. Good, thank you. Thank you, Tim. Awesome, thank you. Great, well, thank you to all of our viewers. And Juliana, did you have a, a couple things you wanted to mention at the end here? Yeah, just in case anyone missed it at the beginning, we did record this webinar and we'll send you a follow-up email tomorrow with a recording and any of the materials that we discussed. So, thank you guys for joining. All right, have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. See you, Dr. Keeley. Thank you. Good night. Good night.